The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everybody. I'm Emily Barr, and I work for America Walks as manager of the Walking College program. Welcome to all of you today for a session on a topic that's of great personal interest, using public art to promote walking and walkable communities. This webinar will feature innovative ways public art is being used in a few communities across the country to reflect the culture and history of those places, while also promoting engaging walkable spaces and a strong sense of place. I'm here today with my colleague, Kelsey Card, who's running the tech behind the scenes, and she will be taking and sharing your questions with the panelists at the end of the call. Before we get started, I wanna thank our sponsors, including the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention for making events such as these possible. And I wanna share a quick note about the technology you should all see a control panel like this one somewhere on your screen. And at the end of the webinar today, or near the end of the webinar, we hope to have a few minutes for a Q&A. So feel free to enter any questions that come to mind uh, in the appropriate field during the course of the session. And now I'll introduce our three esteemed panelists. Ophelia Chambliss is a muralist, artist, and educator in York, Pennsylvania, who creates custom murals and public art pieces. She specializes in murals that project a message, serve a purpose, create community, and are a reflection of her client's mission and objectives. Process and progress are key components in her working methods. The process is planned and managed with inf informative and visual updates. She works with her clients to meet their needs in regard to space, budget, audience, and participation. Ophelia has a master's degree in communications with an emphasis on semiotics, representation in the visual image, and discourse analysis. Her background in communication has proven beneficial in creating a visual image that is functional, informative, and aesthetically appealing. And next, we will have Carla Osete, who is an artist in residence at Lalinia Art Studio, controller at Can-Am Pepper Company, mountain bike coach for the National Interscholastic Cycling Association, and former vice president of OS3 Movement. She was um, clearly needing something else to fill her time, so in 2017, she was a walking college fellow um, she has degrees in business administration, accounting, and art and dance, and she's been published on billboards, participated in national art exhibits, and obtained various best of show awards. She is a grantee of the Arizona Commission on the Arts and was recently named by the Nogales International Newspaper as one of the 2020 shining stars for her giant bike sculpture at Monte Carlo Trails and several mural contributions in her border town, Nogales, Arizona. And I hope I'm correcting, uh, uh, saying that correctly, Carla. And then third, we will have Melissa Johnson, who is cultural, cultural recreation manager with the town of Matthews, North Carolina's Parks, Recreation and Cultural Resource Department. She manages the Matthews Community Center and the McDowell Art Center, oversees summer camps and all programs at these facilities and oversees public art for the town of Matthews. Melissa is a native of Matthews and now lives in Waxhaw, North Carolina. She has degrees in recreation management and therapeutic recreation. So Ophelia, I'm going to turn things over to you now. All right, pulling my screen up here. So I'm very excited about this. And, and as you mentioned in the introduction, I do specialize in trying to meet uh, needs within the community. So a lot of my art does have this visual rhetoric component to it. Uh, one of my larger pieces was this steel structure. It's about 600 pounds of steel, and it's called Beauty, History, and Diversity, because those are the three themes that that community wanted to represent in their neighborhood. Other key the component of that is that it's walkable. Um, it's ground level. It's a sort of thing, kind of an art in the round, that people can actually walk around it. They can actually touch it. So that's why it was important to make it pretty durable and in steel. It has been sitting on this corner in a very busy city with a lot of walking traffic for about 12 years now and has maintained um, itself pretty well with no graffiti or any other issues. I work with a lot of different groups, um, very often preparing public art pieces to go along with other projects. Um, like for example, this piece went along with a community garden. So they, you know, help to put together the mural and create this community garden to also fill that space. Another interesting component of this particular mural was that the young folks who helped paint it 
were um, kids who were part of an adjudicated youth program. So they had been in trouble with the law for one reason or another, but having them participate in painting this uh, gave them a sense of self within that neighborhood because very often when they got out of this program, they would come back to this very neighborhood and they would see something that they had a hand in doing. So, you know, as they walked around, they would have a different appreciation for the art in their community. Do lots of fun projects with different community groups. This was a mural project that was done um, with the Crispus Attic Center, uh, which is our local African American Youth Center. And it was a huge block party type of a project where we had volunteers from Wells Fargo. Um, at the same time, they were painting communities' doors and flower boxes in the neighborhood. They were installing a playground. Um, they were doing a big cleanup project. So this went on for several blocks and everybody, again, had an opportunity to do a piece of this. Um, initially in starting this project, when they told me I was going to have like 100 volunteers, I had to figure out a way to um, make this accessible for everybody to have a piece of it. So I actually had to take this mural and cut it into pieces. So no one actually knew what it was going to look like until it was actually put up on the wall. So that added to the fun of it. So people would come out just to see it put together. And because of the way I do my murals on mural fabric, um, it's often a two-part component. People get to paint it and then they get to come back and help install it as well. Um, I've done projects for school communities to where they wanted to um, abate graffiti that was happening on a wall right there in their community. They came out to help do the painting. They came up with a theme and then the community residents and the school kids helped do the actual installation as well. I do a lot of things that are uh, permanent and sustainable. Um, communities and art within those communities become their personality. So I want something that's going to be there and that's going to last. Uh, this is one of the cows from the cow parade and it's been sitting up on Front Street in Harrisburg for about 11 years now. And again, the walkable nature of it, so being able to put art, you know, even on something as simple as a parking meter that people pass every day or they're putting quarters in every day uh, is also important. We put these meters in to designate the arts district within the community. And then one of the more recent murals that I have put up was this neighborhood association mural. And these are actually images of people who live in this neighborhood. And if you can see on the bottom right, there's this one guy who is painted very blue and the families and the community came out to paint this piece. And the one little girl who's about four years old painted the man blue and her family was mortified, like, oh my goodness, we're so sorry about that. And I explained to them that that is not a problem. And we left him blue because she's four years old now. When she's 14, she'll come back through this neighborhood and know that, you know, I remember when I painted that. So a lot of these kids will grow up with this art. They will grow up knowing that that's their aunt and their uncle featured in this. And they're gonna remember who lived over here on this corner in the church that they went to. And this was one of the stronger neighborhoods within the community. So it was designed with this idea of bamboo being something that is so strong and sustainable and you can see the bamboo kind of intertwined uh, throughout the piece. Um, there are street signs that indicate some of the boundaries of the neighborhood. There's a great deal of neighborhood pride, um, a great deal of diversity within that neighborhood. So in addition to them painting it, um, they all came out and helped to install it as well. So again, you can see the diversity of that community that came and everybody you know, helped to put this up. And, we're very proud of taking that, that photo opportunity. And the little girl who painted the blue man is sitting right down front there to the right of the young lady with the, the red shirt on. So again, she'll remember that, she'll come back and everybody just loves to see the little blue man that she painted there on that mural. And you know, working with you know, the space and what size a piece needed to be you know, um, going through and measuring and working with the community to talk about what it is that represents them. 
um, in this particular mural, which is alongside of a school in Lancaster, you know, they wanted something that was going to go all the way down the side of this building, one to, to eliminate graffiti, but also to talk about, you know, the homes and the families and all of the different windows and the diversity of who, the people who are represented in that neighborhood. So they can be large murals, um, they can be small, they can be bright and colorful. If it's along a busy street where there's driving, they need to be able to catch someone's eye and not look at a lot of detail. If it's within a walking community, we want it to be something that people can kind of stand there and study the piece and take a look at the different faces and see who you recognize you know, within that crowd. But it's going to be something that's of that community. And I think that's very important to do. I've done um, a variety of sizes. Um, I work with a mural fabric. I've worked on, for example, this cow was a large plaster piece. It was a life-sized cow. Uh, I work on putting things on the fabric and then adhering it to the wall. And it also has a great deal of permanency to it. And as you'll see from the very beginning, you know, even working on steel which gives it a sense of permanency i remember when we first installed this piece they were concerned about graffiti they were concerned about maybe a car running into it but because the community helped to decide what this was and it was a representation of who they were again it has been there for about 11 or 12 years and it has become a keystone piece people use it as a directional piece within that community so that, that's just a few of the pieces. I have approximately 30 permanent and public installation pieces throughout central Pennsylvania. Um, in Gettysburg, I have uh, three steel towers that are a representation and a dedication to the third ward in that area. And it's right across the street from a segregated cemetery that holds 31 of the United States colored troops that were there at the Battle of Gettysburg. It is listed on the historic markers and database, and it is part of the walking tours through Gettysburg when people come through to visit the battlegrounds and to visit the area and its Civil War history. They come and they look at that mural because it has a tree that designates some of the names of the, the troops and the families that are there now. It is across from the cemetery where a lot of these gentlemen are buried, and it is a significant part of that area and the history there in Gettysburg. So I do, again, working with communities, developing a personality for the pieces, and that personality is a part of that neighborhood going forward. As I feel public art and public murals um, capture a moment in time so people know who these people were at this place at this time, and I think that's critical. So I thank you guys for letting me be a part of this. And I hope that um, people enjoyed the images and you know, keep an eye out for more coming up in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ophelia. I love the vibrancy of your work. The colors just are so bright and cheerful and I'm sure have really done a lot to brighten up a lot of uh, neighborhoods. Um, Carla, you are up next, if you wouldn't mind sharing your screen. I'm sharing it now. Can you see it? Let's see. I am not, but others may be. Kelsey, do you see it? Yep, we're good to go. Okay. Okay, thank you. Ophelia, that was a beautiful presentation. Uh, thanks to Ian, Emily, Nicole, and the America Walks for having me on this webinar. I'm super excited. Um, I am a res artist in residence at La Linea Art Studio on Morley Avenue, Nogales, Arizona. Nogales, Arizona is a small border town um, between U.S. and Mexico, and uh, we have about 20,000 residents, uh, of which 90% are bilingual and Hispanic. Um, Nogales is the number one port of entry in the Southwest and has been named one of the safest cities in Arizona. And I, you know, I felt it was important to mention that because some of the news that are, you know, published 
uh, north or other way parts of the country, you know, have another perception. Um, I paint since age 12, and I am super proud to be from this town where bicultural heritage thrives regardless of any any wall. Um, some of the challenges that I see the art community face in towns like Nogales is that uh, when promoting walking um, where the disinvestment is clear is is difficult uh, because there are no funds for public art and you know if there if there are they're probably small or fall at last in their in government um, but I do think it's important to mention that any government is always open to listen to us as artists. So if there, there are any art, artists out there listening, um, go, go to your city, go to your public officials and ask, you know, ask to give them a presentation. You never know where, what opportunities may come your way. Um, it may seem discouraging, but I think it's a tremendous opportunity for us as artists to step up to make a difference. And uh, most important, to inspire younger uh, generations. On this presentation, I am going to be showing some of my murals and other topics. Um, I think murals are super important because um, it's, it's a critical component to create a walkable community because most people love the sign and color. And it makes makes us feel good and bring memories and experiences. And that aside of the political, social, and cultural expression. Now, some of the success part uh, factors that I found um, from being is that regardless if there's a, a call or um, you know, any opportunity, we have to continue creating. Um, and most importantly, to keep close relationships and allies with um, local nonprofit organizations. In my case, I, you know, I was always close with the local galleries in Mexico, Casa de la Cultura, and in Nogales, Arizona, with, with the Hilltop Gallery. And I think that was key into getting my art know and it opened the door to many opportunities. In my recent years, um, I associated with Cero Stress Movement, a cycling group, and the Walking College. And uh, those two organizations helped me in a great manner to, to access resources that, you know, really helped me take my art practice from private to public. Um, this is a billboard that was published by uh, the Hilltop Gallery, and it was shown on a state street. It lasted about one to two months on the street, and because it's a, it was a huge piece, I thought that you know I I could not just let it let it go to the landfill. So thanks to the Nogales Community Development, they rehomed the bill, billboard and is now shown shown on a downtown building and it gives a, a wonderful view of the building so if you know if there there's uh, listeners here that do this type of work um go and pay for the for the billboard when when it's down so that you can relocate it to other spaces here is some mural i i uh, led at the nogales food bank um, the food bank wanted to have a better view of their, their building, but they had no no funding basically. So what what they did is to help me get uh, materials from the local Home Depot. And uh, what I found is that when when artists have good projects, uh, the local business owners will be willing to invest in, in them so that the the um, Buildings look better, communi communities look better. One of the best uh, 
taste I, I've got from my artwork is working with youth. Uh, on this mural, I work with uh, youth ages 6 to 16, I believe. And it, you know, it really changed the way I saw things for as an artist into my community because I felt I, I gave a legacy to these kids here and they, they felt empowered and eager and very happy to be helping. This is a small mural done at the Nogales, Santa Cruz County Chamber of Commerce. Um, this small mural is of cultural context. As you can see, there's a girl flying on a hummingbird, very colorful, and holding flags of two countries. Because I live in a border town, I felt it was important to somehow show that regardless of whatever division we may have, we, ambos Nogales uh, residents, really feel our town as, you know, sister cities. We care for each other. So this, this was my, my best way to show something about the feeling of our border towns. Now let's talk about this, this um investing basically when especially now that the economy is down you know we'll probably face some difficulties in getting our art project funded right so i i feel this is a very good example of uh we basically don't have excuses because we can create art with most any any materials out there um for this bike is located at the Monte Carlo Trail in Nogales, Arizona, and it was done in partnership with Cero Stress Movement, the city of Nogales, and the Arizona Commission of the Arts. Um, funding for this was, was low, but thanks that, you know, uh, that I went and knocked on the doors of these business owners, local hardware stores, uh, I was able to obtain a lot of uh, materials on this bike all of them recycled. And um, I don't know if you can distinguish the tires are made out of uh, air unit turbines. And, you know, the owner of this uh, air conditioning store was super happy that uh, I went there and cleaned up his yard. Um, and then the rest of the bike is made out of with old abandoned bikes. Um, I don't know if you can distinguish them here in the back foot. And then mo most of the tubes are made out of old trampolines, pieces that were already destined for the landfill. Um, in this project, I, I had the participation of uh, several people that had experience with welding. And thanks to that, we were able to complete this project in the course of about uh, three months. Uh, I think this is the most meaningful meaningful project that I have worked on, and it's located at a mountain bicycle path trail in in Nogales. Here is another project done at Monte Carlo. Um, bike trail, it's landscape art. On this, this project, um, many volunteers from Cero Estres Movement ra raising all ages participated and it was done with Cero Estres, the city of Nogales and Arizona Arts Commission. And this was too, along with the metal bike, this was too uh, part of my 2017 working action plan for the walking college. Um, I really appreciate all attendees of this webinar for listening and to the America Walks for having me. Thanks so much, Carla. I'm so glad that I was finally able to see your images. I couldn't see them for a bit and they're beautiful and oh, no. really neat. So thank you so much for sharing with us. Okay, last but not least, yeah. of course, we have Melissa. Um, 
Melissa, if you could share your screen. There we go. Can everybody see it? Yes. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm honored to be a part of this conversation um, and to share just a little bit about our public art program in Matthews, North Carolina. So if you don't know where we are, we are a suburb of Charlotte, North Carolina. We are on the Southeast side. So um, we're kind of our own small town of about 30,000 people. And I'll give a perspective from a government side and the process that's involved um, on our end for public art and also how we feel public art is important in our town and it's something that has definitely grown over the years. So our public art program started um, back in 2013, maybe a couple of years earlier, but it started out really small before there was an actual budget for it and they were dedication pieces and a couple murals that were created maybe on the computer and then were printed on vinyl and then adhered to the brick. And these are just a couple of the pieces that started the program, ones at the McDowell Art Center and then the library piece is behind the library in downtown Matthews. And this is a collaboration project with the library itself. Um, and it's just the top 25 most checked out books at that specific location. And this specific piece we're actually planning on expanding in the next year, hopefully. The momentum for public art in Matthews started to take off in 2013. There were a couple of sculptures that were added and a couple more murals. And all of these public art pieces are within walking distance of our downtown footprint. So all of them are accessible to the community. Um, there's sidewalks to get to most all of these accessible routes. Um, and they're just kind of scattered throughout um, all of downtown Matthews. I came on board in 2017 in that August, and these are just some of the pieces that we have added since then. There's been about five murals and five sculptures. A couple of them are not pictured on here since, um, since I've been there. The town board and the town itself is very supportive of our public art momentum and wants to see it continue to grow. Most of the art here, they're location specific themes. So, the stair murals are specific to their actual locations. There's a couple pollinator pieces, sculpture and mural that are both in a small pocket park that also has a large pollinator garden. There's a veteran sculpture that's located at the veteran memorial area of a park in downtown Matthews. And then the large mural that's on the brick wall, um, that one is called Celebrating Matthews. And that one features um, some pictures from our famous Labor Day parade that attracts over 100,000 people each year. And inside of that piece, it also has small nods to the community. There's a French flag to signify our relationship with our sister city in St. Maxim's, France. There's flowers to represent the hard work that Public Works puts in all year to beautify our downtown area. And it also shows some of the historic buildings in downtown Matthews. All of these different artworks are within walking distance of our downtown area, like I said earlier. Um, and during a month long campaign of Love Matthews, we had an art walk challenge designed where people would follow a list of a lot of the public art that is in downtown Matthews and people were encouraged to walk to each one of these, take their photo and tag us on social media. This is a way to get the community involved in our public art, to make them more aware of the amount of public art that we have in town and just to show their love for Matthews. On the list of the different art pieces, we included the location, the date of the installation and some of the history of the actual art piece or the artist who did the work. And this project was so well received that we actually left the Art Walk Challenge on our town website so that way people could do it anytime. Another big part of our public art program is our Greenway art. We have a, we're really fortunate to have a two mile section of Greenway that is just outside of the footprint of downtown Matthews. And it connects several neighborhoods and one of our parks along the way. Along the Greenway are manhole covers and sewer pipes that we have invited the public and community members to come and paint. There is an application process, but you don't have to be an artist. You could just be someone who likes art or likes painting. You could be a part of a group or you could be an individual. And it's a fun way for the community to show their creativity. And it's also fun for everybody who uses the Greenway. Some are very humorous, like the giraffe there. Um, and some are maybe more meaningful, the sea turtle with the 
tree of life around it and showing more environmentally centered pieces. And the design that the applicants submit does have to go through an approval process before we can get started on the project, but it is all volunteer work um, from people in the community, so they don't get paid to do this. They're just doing it for their love of the community and their love of the art. And we as a town do have it in our budget to provide the supplies and we do a little bit of maintenance around the actual piece so that way it is accessible for the artist and we do kind of maintain the weed eating around it so that way it doesn't get overgrown. We did add two, uh, we did add a sculpture on the Greenway this past year. It was a Archimedean solid shape and the first piece was actually stolen off of the Greenway. Um, and since then we've learned um, to put more secure measures in place on how to attach it to a pedestal. So we did replace it with another piece and we eventually found the piece that was taken um, and we have a plan to put it in another park. But that is a risk of putting public art in an area that is kind of out of, out of the way. Um, there's not a lot of traffic in the evenings. There is a lot of traffic through the day, but otherwise, nobody probably saw it happen. Some background about a specific project that we have. Um, there's a road hump that crosses McDowell Street, which is in our cultural arts district of downtown Matthews. And this area is home to the Matthews Community Center and the McDowell Arts Center. Next door to this is the elementary school and there's also a church on the other side of the drive. So it's an area that gets a lot of pedestrian traffic and some driving traffic as well. There's a road hump crossing area on the McDowell Street that gets a lot of pedestrian traffic all times of year. During the school year, the elementary students and their parents are crossing it in the mornings and afternoons to get to and from school. During the summer, summer campers are crossing the area to get to the playground or to a different building. During Labor Day weekend with our big festival, pedestrians are walking through the street and the directional arrows that are by this hump are covered up by craft vendors and people often trip over the incline of the road hump because they don't see the arrows. When the cars drive on the street, they aren't necessarily looking for pedestrians because it just looks like a road hump and they aren't expecting pedestrian traffic unless they're familiar with the area. So we wanted to bring attention to this area, make it more visible for both pedestrians and for drivers and to help create a safer area. We painted what you're seeing as a temporary installation right before our Labor Day Festival to see how it would hold up to traffic how it would be perceived by the town, the board, and just the general public, and to bring awareness to the area. This is a really inexpensive project. We just used finger paint and rollers, and we did it ourselves as staff. And as you can see, public work stepped in when our lines weren't straight enough for them, so it made it look even better. Um, the paint did hold up for several weeks, and we eventually used a pressure washer to clean it off, but the town board liked the idea of this being an area for public art, and we were kind of given the green light to go ahead and put something more permanent there in that area. So about this time, the community change grant through America Walks came about, and this was a perfect opportunity to try to get funding for this road hump crossing area. And our goal was to have a unique mural planned for this area. We hope to include community engagement by having community members help paint the mural, and the mural would incorporate important themes in the history of the town and would beautify the area as well as bring attention to the crossing area and the pedestrians who utilize it with the hope of improving pedestrian safety in this area of town. We would have loved to involve the school and have them be a part of the painting or involve a lot of the community members, which was part of the original plan. But by the time we got to actual installation time, COVID-19 happened, so we weren't able to involve any of the public. We did receive this grant, by the way, from America Walk. So this is a little bit about our process of public art in Matthews and then how it related specifically to this project. So we put out a call to, for artists back in mid-November and we received applications from five different artists. And the artists were asked to create a design that would incorporate important features and themes of Matthews and the history of town. Artists submitted at least one design for consideration. Our Parks, Recreation, and Cultural Resource Department staff narrowed it down to the top three artists based on their submissions. The town's public art process includes having a public input meeting to let people know about the potential public art piece. And it also gives the community an opportunity to come and share their opinions on the location or the piece itself. 
The advisory committee chose the artist based on seeing two to three different designs from the top three artists that they were shown. They voted for this particular artist. Um, her name is Muriel and they liked her artwork and specifically liked one design that had dogwood flowers on it. We have some other public art in town that focuses on different pollinators and the town of Matthews is a bee city USA and is also a tree city. So the native tree and the pollinator features of the dogwood flower, not to mention the dogwood is North Carolina state flower. They both give a nod to both of these titles. And there is the image that was selected. So Muriel sent in a total of five different designs. And once the dogwood design was chosen, I shared this image with our town engineer for feedback from a safety aspect, because that was important to include. And the only changes mentioned were to add a little bit more contrast, which just meant that the artist had to shift a couple of things over. So our public art definitely involves a lot of different departments and isn't just within our own department. Public Works also has a large part investment in our work as well, because they're usually involved with installation, especially with sculptures or um, getting street signage, street closures and things like that. They're wonderful to work with. Um, so once we got approval of this artwork, we had to schedule installation with the artist and she lives about two and a half hours away and is full, has full-time employment elsewhere. So we had to work around her work schedule and also schedule around the weather. It's, it's been pretty hot here for this area um, in the 90s. And as if we had waited any later in June, it would have been too hot to paint on the asphalt. Um, we also had had about two weeks straight of rain. So we were also working around that. And whenever she came, this past Friday is actually when she started. It rained that evening, but luckily we had beautiful weather for the rest of the weekend. So that worked out really well. And even though we couldn't have the public come and paint this project with us, we did put it out on social media and let them know that we were installing it, let them know to stop by, talk to the artists, become involved in that way. And because it was beautiful and this area is really close to the Greenway, um, there were a lot of people who were walking or biking by to get to the Greenway who stopped and talked to her as she was painting it. And the next two slides are images of the process and the finished product. We did a cool time lapse video that showed most of the process and we posted that on our social media page on a to town's Facebook page. And overall, considering we had all that rain before and the beautiful weekend was a nice change and she was able to get this completely installed in under three days. She also put a couple coats of sealant on top of it to help preserve the paint and hopefully it'll last a little bit longer than it would otherwise. We also know that this is a temporary installation because it is on the road and there are cars who drive over it, but we hope it will last for a while. Um, I did include some resources here and in the PDF version that will be available later, they are clickable links. So you'll be able to access the Art Walk Challenge, if that's something that you're interested to do in your own community. Um, because we are right outside Charlotte, North Carolina, um, Charlotte has a ton of public art and they have a big street art scene. And so those are a couple of links to different projects that take place over there. And I also listed my contact information if anybody wants to reach out, has any questions, um, how to get involved with your local government or if you are on the government side, maybe where to start or how to get in touch with artists. So thank you so much. Thank you, Melissa. That's really great stuff there. And thanks to all of our presenters today. Um, we have plenty of time, it looks like, for Q&A. Kelsey, do we have any questions? Yeah, we have a lot of really great questions. Um, I think, you know, there were a few for Melissa here with some of the installations, so we can start with those and then kind of work our way back a bit. Um, so a few of the questions that came in were from people wanting to know if, um, let's see, the mid-block crossings, there's someone that wants to install mid-block crossings in their city, but they've been told it poses a hazard by their DOT. So how did you get the colorful crossings approved? There was another question that kind of echoed that as well. Um, and they also want to know what the budget was like um, 
And if you had any concerns around people with visual impairments when taking into account the multicolored crosswalk? These are great questions. Um, so to start with the approval, um, the street that, where this was located, there's still some question as to who actually owns it. Um, is, it a, is it a town street? Does T DOT own it? But because um, the town does maintain it, um, we were just able to do it. And it was a small enough project that it didn't get large attention from DOT. So we just did it. <laughs> um, as far as the budget, the grant actually provided most of the budget for this project. We do have a budget for public art in our department budget, um, but this specific one with the grant, we were able to pay the artist more than we would have been able to do so otherwise. And then we also provided a stipend for the artist in case, you know, to cover any of their supplies and things like that. Um, as far as considerations for someone with visual impairment, um, there are the, the round dots at the um, cutouts right before you approach it. Um, there wasn't, honestly, there wasn't a lot of specific consideration or um, planning for an individual with a visual impairment in the actual design. Um, I think that is important to do and I'm afraid that we did not take that into consideration in the plan of that design. Thank you so much, Melissa. So this is one I think um, you all can weigh in on. Um, we had a few questions about just the longevity of the art that was put up in the maintenance that goes into that. Um, people were wondering, you know, and, and touching on the fact that it can be a difficult aspect of infrastructure. So how does someone know or what does one look for when considering artists and then dealing with the maintenance of those installations? So Hi, this is Ophelia. Um, a lot of the pieces I do tend to be larger and people tend to be looking for something that is going to last a, a really long time because they're paying you know, a decent amount of money for it. And sometimes they're through grants and they're also through private clients. So it's a question of what materials you choose to use. Um, I work either on steel or on the mural fabric. When applying the mural fabric to buildings, it actually kind of maintains the bricks for them and eliminates any of that crumbling. And the paints that I use are light fast, high resin paints that are good for outdoors for about 35 to 40 years without any fading. So it's, again, it's about the materials that they use and some of the practices, and there are UV coatings that you could use as well. Thanks, Ophelia. Carla, did you wanna weigh in on, on that at all and, and touch on some of the materials as well? Yeah, yeah sure. I, I also, before proposing a project, I consider using durable materials i in sculpture i use a, a steel and if it's a mural i i would use a hundred percent acrylic paints and make sure i do prime uh the walls um, as to what main maintenance pertain it, it can get tricky right because i don't know if it's only me but i tend to be too attached to the the works of art i do and I, you know, I want to be the one who maintains it, it so that it lasts because I put too much heart into it, heart and work. But um, there, it happens that the, depending who you work for, they'll, they'll want to take ownership too. Just like, unfortunately, just like if they were paying for a fence or a door and, and, the, and they'll say, hey, no don't touch it, we'll, we'll, we'll take care of it. So, you know, that's one of the downsides of, you know, putting public art because um, to begin with, you uh, you do it with unconditional love, but also you have to be willing to let go, to let go. And I, I mean, if art appreciators will always maintain pieces out there, and if, if as an artist, if you see they don't, you step on the plate because you care for the piece. Um, I hope I answered. 
I answered the question. Yeah, thank you so much, Carla. So, Melissa, did you have anything mm -hmm. to add to that? I would say it depends on the piece as far as the maintenance. Um, if there are some pieces where we do ask the artist to stay involved, and sometimes they want to be, just like Carla was saying. Um, we have a sculpture, for example, that is made out of recycled materials, and it started to have a lot of wear and tear in the park, and the artist actually just came back to weld on a couple of the petals. This is a bee sculpture. Um, a couple of petals had fallen off, and the paint had started to fade, so she actually came and welded them back on and put another coat of paint on it and more clear coat. And then there are some other um, projects that we maintain, whether it's just by putting on more coats of sealant or getting in touch with the artist itself to find out the best way to take care of it. And we do also look for durable materials and ask, you know, we make sure we know what the artist is using before we purchase the art or before the art is installed, because that is important to know as well. Great. Thank you so much. Um, we've also had some questions around just the impact and engagement of different installations. So um, do you notice an impact between the temporary installations versus more permanent ones? And also just in general, um, if you if you take note and measure at all, the increases in people walking and moving since the art is installed. Sure. So, well, I. Oh. You go, Arifa. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I would say we do notice um, an increase, uh, especially right after a piece of art is installed, whether that's just from promotion or if it's something that has been installed in place or created in place and people have been around it and involved in it. Um, and especially since we people were on quarantine, a lot of people were outside walking noticing public art in our town more, which has been really great. Great. Thank you, Melissa. Carla? Oh, I wanted to say that I've been able to measure it by the use of my Instagram page. Uh, on the public pieces I put, I put my, my Instagram uh, address, and it, it is uh, so rewarding to see that you know walkers pass, take pictures, and then tag tag the artist. So that's that's the way I found that people actually you know uh, pass through there and then spread the the word around, and then people start sending sending data so that I can measure. Um, right here, I know for a fact because we live in a border town. Uh, border uh, border patrols uh, patrolling bikes in mountain bikes. So I, you know, I've encountered them where my pieces are because they're in trails, they're in the middle of nowhere, and they have actually take taken ownership of the place because they do appreciate the pieces on on that property. Thank you so much, Ophelia. Yeah, I've had people take pictures in front of the pieces um, and they might tag me in it or it might show up. I, I use Google Analytics. So whenever an image or a mention of the art shows up in places, um, I, I get an alert through um, the Google Analytics. And I've had people and I've gotten lots of referrals where people would see the artwork, uh, see the name on it and would reach out to say, I, re I really like this piece. Can you do a mural? here and you know in our community because they recognize it was a, a community project so yeah the, the visibility is there and i've done some temporary ones like playground type things uh, where the kids were able to to interact with those and you know they're short-lived but um i remember kids saying oh i remember playing on that one that's really cool Thank you all so much. So we've also gotten a lot of ideas or questions about um, the community organizing that goes into this and the, the volunteer component. Um, so if you could talk a little bit about the importance of that and also how you might remove potential barriers for getting community members to participate as well. Uh, this is Ophelia, I'll jump right into this one right away. A lot of my projects are done through either um, civic organizations like city government and county government or even through clinics and hospitals 
or neighborhood association. So I have neighborhood stakeholders as well as um, public grantees and city administration. And it usually it's just them taking interest in their neighborhood. And very often I spend time walking around that neighborhood and asking them questions and have you seen this and done, you know, coloring book pages of, you know, sketch, sketches for the artwork to get the kids involved. Um, but I usually, you know, part of it is an agreement with those stakeholders that, you know, they will bring the people in and I will, you know, help them bring the people in. And so it's a very, you know, it's quite the ground game, lots of walking, lots of talking to people. But yeah, definitely re developing a real partnership in, in this. Thank you so much. Um, Carla or Melissa? Um, I do agree that in order to get to more, you know, to get volunteers, you do want to look for partnerships with uh, local organizations and involve them. If if you want to call, have them be the champion of the project. But it all depends on of what the project is and the scale, right? If it's if it's a small mural, then I probably just need one two volunteers that I know they want to participate but um, it depends on the project like for the bike sculpture I did call for volunteers but they had to have some experience with working with metals especially to protect them from hazard and, and stuff like that but yeah working with uh, local organization is the best to get to volunteers Thank you, Melissa. I would agree with everything <laughs> that they said. I don't. I don't have much to add. Um, I think it is important, just depending on the neighborhood where you are putting in the public art, that they do have a say. And whether that's just a promotion of the upcoming project, having public input meetings, especially if you're a government organization, um, making sure that the community has a voice and can share their opinion on the project, even just the location. They you'd be surprised how many have strong feelings about it. Yeah, great, thank you so much. So we've had a question from one attendee about how to um, contact artists and, and muralists for, for doing these installations. So they were wondering if there's a, a resource, like a centralized resource to find artists if, that you all know about or is it something that someone should just kind of put the time into finding people that they like who are local and reaching out to them? I think most artists have websites or you can Google most artists, but there is a public art network where artists can register and you can look for artists through there. Um, but I think a lot of people look just for different styles and it's you know the artist promotion and putting themselves out there as a public artist or a muralist um, I have two different websites, one for my fine art and paintings and one, you know, as a muralist because they are kind of two different things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I would say, this is Melissa, I would say that whenever I'm looking for an artist, obviously it depends on the project itself. Sometimes I contact an artist directly based on what I've seen on their website or seen through social media in our area, especially if I'm looking for a local artist. I also work with the local arts commission and the arts and science council and local artist groups and guilds to see if any artists fit what we're looking for or even if we're just throwing out an idea and looking for an artist. A lot of times I'll start on the local scale and then expand a little bit bigger. Thanks so much. Carla, anything to add? Uh, well, as, as an artist, um... I only use my Instagram per se because I don't, uh, I have, you know, my full-time job and art is, you know, kind of my lifestyle and it's with me, but I'm not quite ready to be a hundred percent working on that. So I don't have a web page or anything, but I would say the a perfect uh, resource to find artists are mu local museums, galleries, the art commission for every state in online pages. 
Great. Thank you all so much. So we've still got a number of great questions and we'll try to ask just a couple more. Um, one that's come in that's quite timely is, you know, how comfortable are you taking political stances in your art, especially if the community is, is excited about it? Um, particularly, can public art play a role in this current effort to defund police? This is Ophelia. I will jump in here. Um, I, I think right now there's a big call for, based on the, the circumstances, both COVID and uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, to for communities to identify themselves as being you know, supportive of and, and partners in and champions of getting through this together. So um, I've done a couple of Black Lives Matter type mural pieces that might get per, you know, permanently installed someplace, but also more work in identifying neighborhoods, you know, and the, the strength and diversity in neighborhoods. I think as artists, it is kind of our job um, to record this history and to mark these moments and we do more than make pretty pictures. We make statements. And I think that's what gets saved. You know, when we talk about museums and, you know, when there was a fighter in Notre Dame, and, you know, people go out and they save artwork. They save those things that are creatable and, and, and um, appreciate and value. So I think right now is a really important time for artists to do that. Thank you, Ophelia. Anyone else want to weigh in on that? Um, I can put my two cents into it. I do have a few uh, political uh, subject um, pieces. Uh, the one that I showed you is, of, you know, it, it's well received, it, it's beautiful, but there are others that I've done showing, uh, per se, the international border wall and people hugging across the, the wall. Um, so I surprisingly I I found that those are the pieces that have more success with people because people feel connected. Uh, one of the purposes I I've, I've learned of art is is to generate a feeling, a connection, a memory. So the few pieces I've done with political context are the most popular I would say. Thank you. Melissa? So as a small town government, um, we have to stay somewhat neutral in politics here. Um, but I do want to give a big shout out to Charlotte, who just painted yesterday, they just installed a huge Black Lives Matter down the main street in Uptown Charlotte, similar to the one that's in Washington, DC. But each letter has different designs inside of it and they brought together so many different artists and they paid the artists to do it so it's an incredible piece very moving I think that art speaks to the people and can definitely um, just be so important in times like this it's very important thank you so much we really appreciate um, all of the great questions and they are not lost on us. We were gonna be sending those out to panelists. So if they have time to answer those, we'll be doing that and send it back out to you with the recording. So I will toss it back to Emily here now to kind of wrap us up. Can you hear me? We can. Yes. Okay, and you can see my screen? Great. Yes. Um, well, thanks everybody again. Thank you to our sponsors. Thanks to our participants. Thanks for um, our panelists, obviously, and thank you for all the great, great questions. Um, today's webinar has been recorded and it will be archived should you wish to rewatch it or share it with your colleagues. And um, I also want to let you know before we leave you that our next Webinar will be June 23rd and we'll focus on pedestrian safety on tribal land. So I hope that many of you will join us for that one. Thanks so much for being here today, everybody.